Hi everybody, it's Adam with heartvalvesurgery.com. And today we have a very exciting surgeon question and answer session all about the new PROACT XA clinical trial. To answer your questions, we're gonna bring in Dr. Mark Gerdish, who is the Chief of Cardiac Surgery at Franciscan Health in Indianapolis, Indiana. Dr. Gerdish, are you there? I'm here. Hi, Adam. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gerdish, I can't thank you enough. And if there's one thing I want to share with our community, everybody watching now, is that Dr. Gerdish is celebrated by the patients and the caregivers at heartvalvesurgery.com. He's educated folks. He's empowered folks. And he's also performed successful heart valve surgery on folks like Angie Gregory, Todd Runenbaum, Linda Staples, Linda Kincaid, and he has over a hundred patient testimonials at our website. Dr. Gerdish, I can't thank you enough for being with us today. Thank you, Adam, and it's nice to be part of the family. It's unbelievable how so many people are so involved, and, and I love that uh, people communicate through your site. Can we maybe start off with a little bit about you? What, what was it about heart valve therapy, repairs and replacements, that made you make this such an important part of your cardiac practice? It's a difficult question to answer because it, it happened over the course of my career. And I think I often kind of feel like uh, heart valve surgery chose me as much as I chose it. Uh, as a teenager, even, I, was, uh, I had a very um, uh, romantic notion about uh, cardiac physiology. And as I learned more about structure and physics of the heart, I became very enamored of the function of the valves, the integral performance of the valves in the heart, uh, and how the synergy existed between the heart valves and the heart itself, such an elegant relationship. And I wanted to participate in restoring that to function when I could. Got it. And, and restoring that function for your patients, you definitely have. I know all, I've heard all about the research. I've seen the research you do. The innovations with the re rigid sternal fixation, cryoanalgesia. And I understand that minimally invasive therapies has been a big part of your practice. Can you talk about how that is impacting uh, the patients who are coming to you for heart valve surgery? It, you know, that's proven to be very important uh, for so many of my patients that want to get right back to full activity. Um, I think that, you know, the most important thing in any operation is a perfect operation on the valve, the valve surgery itself, repairing the valve, restoring it to normal function, making sure the heart is well. But the next thing that's really important to people is how quickly they get back to their normal activity what level of change in their chest architecture has there been? How comfortable are they? And for so many of our patients, we've been able to move over to very small incisions, very minimal discomfort, and get them back into full action quickly. So Dr. Gerdish, I want to ask you to help the patients contextualize the difference between a sternotomy and a minimally invasive approach can you maybe talk about that and maybe use your hands to show the different access points you use? Sure, that's my pleasure. And I, I do think it's important for patients to genuinely understand it. So sternotomy is any time that we divide any part of the sternum. There are operations that we'll do through mini sternotomies. We still kind of consider that a minimally invasive operation, but we're dividing bone. And that is different than not dividing bone. So, going through the sternum. When we do have to go through the sternum, in our practice, we always use rigid sternal fixation when we finish. In other words, we do an orthopedic repair of that bone to return it to full function immediately after surgery. In general though, we stay off of the sternum. The vast majority of the operations we do through a small incision on the side of the chest. So for aortic surgery, we do it through an incision right here, a small incision right here next to the sternum. And for mitral surgery, you do it through a small incision right underneath the right nipple. So either way, not a very big incision, uh, which is nice cosmetically. More importantly, no cutting of bone, no breaking of bone, no dividing anything except separating the muscle fibers and putting them back together. Uh, that along with uh, the relatively advanced methodologies for localized analgesia have provided us with super fast recovery in a comfortable patient. A question that many newly diagnosed patients is, why do I need a heart valve replacement? Sure, so I think uh, to start off with, a heart valve has to be replaced when it can't be repaired. 
So we always look at a valve first for the opportunity to repair it, whether it's a mitral or an aortic valve. If it cannot be repaired, if it cannot be restored to function, because the patient is always better off with their own tissue. It is the primary reason that people do so well for so long with their own heart valves, right? But when we have to replace it, then we want to use the appropriate device for that patient. And if possible, we want to, we want to implant it through the least traumatic and the smallest access. So the vast majority, nearly all of isolated aortic valve replacements in my practice are done through a small incision, usually without touching the sternum. So staying away from the bone and working between the ribs. I feel like we've really mastered a technique for creating analgesia in that space that although it, pre it provides a little bit of numbness and that can last several weeks, it also provides a really comfortable uh, recovery and that allows people to get right back in action doing whatever their normal activities are. Can you describe the different types of heart valve replacements that are available to patients? Right, so now there are a lot of options. Um, and over time, that's expanded a little bit. I think that uh, most people who are experiencing valve problems become familiar with really three general categories. Uh, mechanical valves, which sometimes people call metal valves, although they're actually made of carbon. Uh, Bioprosthetic valves or biologic valves, which actually has two, co two uh, components. One are the standard surgical biologic valves, which are made of cow tissue or pig tissue. Cow tissue valves are made from the sac around the heart of a cow. Pig tissue valves are made from the leaflets, usually the leaflets of a pig valve. And then there's a kind of a third category that's a subcategory that was a transcatheter valves. So those are really the three general categories that when we meet any given patient, we have a conversation about all of those possibilities. Can you talk about maybe the advantages or maybe even disadvantages of the different valves you just mentioned? The conversation is kind of always the same, only adjusted a little bit based on a person's age and the things that we might call comorbidities, other issues that they have, the physiologic challenges or even physical challenges that they have. So we try to frame it according to that. And my conversation usually begins with really spending some time just understanding what the patient is looking for, what their expectations are, what their hopes are. Uh, because it's true that, for example, a mechanical valve may never need another operation, probably will never need another operation. They last the entirety of your life, but you do have to be on blood thinner. Tissue valves, you don't have to be on blood thinner, but they do have a clock on them. As soon as they're implanted, they start to change a little bit. And over time, they'll require a second or even a third operation, depending on the age of the patient when they receive it. And transcatheter valves, we're still kind of an evolving technology with them. Uh, we love them because they provide rapid treatment for patients. And uh, the vast majority of our patients go home the next day after a transcatheter valve. But we're just really learning about their durability they have certain drawbacks with respect to the requirement for pacemakers and also the challenges of a second valve if they need it or a third valve if they need it. Those, are, those become more complicated for those patients. So depending on a patient's age, the demands of their lifestyle, their uh, other medical issues, all of those factors get compiled into a, a thorough discussion of what the options are for the patient. Great, and let's maybe focus in now on the mechanical valve set, which is often, as you referred to, is the dur durability. A lot of patients that I speak with often say, hey, I want a one and done. Uh, and then they talk about the use of blood thinners. Can you maybe talk uh, uh, and share with the patients what the expectation should be for a patient who goes on blood thinner? Does it, is there anything they should know about being on a blood thinner for the rest of their life? The thing about blood thinners with valves is that it's the same as blood thinners with anything else. So patients have to be on blood thinners for clots in their veins, for clots that, goes to their, that go to their lungs, for atrial fibrillation. And in fact, even in tissue valves, if we look at the literature, roughly a third of all the patients who have tissue valves are also on blood thinners. So blood thinners in and of themselves present their own challenges. They are a medication that have an indication for different disorders. One of the conditions that a blood thinner is necessary for is when a patient has a mechanical valve. 
So the real challenge with a blood thinner is that if the blood gets too thin, the patient can bleed. I mean, that's the complication that you run into with blood thinners. Now, people are naturally very concerned about that, especially if they have active lifestyles. But I can tell you that I have a lot of people who play basketball, go skiing, do all their normal things on blood thinners. The point is that if you're going to be on a blood thinner, you have to have good control over it. And in fact, when we have patients on blood thinners for mechanical valves, and it's warfarin or Coumadin, we have those patients almost invariably arranged to have home monitoring. So they just check it once a week and we make sure it's in the zone and they go about their lives. Still though, for a mechanical valve, for all mechanical valves except for one, you have to be on a fairly high dose of the blood thinner and it puts you in a range that has some risk attached to it. So several years ago, we did a study called the PROACT trial and we proved with a randomized control study, so the most rigorous type of science you can use, we proved that for a particular type of mechanical valve, the onyx valve, that we could run that at a lower dose of blood thinner that we could bring what we call the INR, which is what we measure to ascertain how thin the blood is. We could bring that down into a range never before used for mechanical valves and it proved to be perfectly safe. There was no increase in the threat, which is thromboembolic events related to the valve, strokes or clots, no increase in that while decreasing the incidence of bleeding complications by 60%. So, 60% sounds like a big number, but it's actually a huge number because if you look at, if you compare that to the bleeding events for patients who have tissue valves, like I said, many of them have to be on blood thinners anyway, it's about the same. So we pretty much neutralize the impact of it. Still though, there's inconvenience. You gotta take the pill, you gotta check it. Uh, there are certain foods you can't eat a lot of or you can't binge on. Uh, you can't drink heavily, you can't binge drink. There are things like that, all of which are just kind of guidelines that we should follow for a healthy life anyway, but they pertain to people that are taking that medicine for their mechanical valves. I think it's important that people understand that when we put any kind of valve in a person, it doesn't matter, any of those categories, that valve is not part of their normal body, right? So the body identifies it and the body reacts to it in some way. In the case of mechanical valves, it's that they have a little bit higher, they have a higher tendency of getting a little bit of clot on them, right? So that's why you have to be on the blood thinner. In a biologic valve, it's that your body identifies it as foreign and your body kind of attacks it. And over time, the leaflets become calcified or they tear because they are deteriorating. So it's a, a matter of kind of choosing the process that suits you the best. Like you mentioned before, one and done. Right? So there are patients who say, okay, well, I'll just take that lower dose of blood thinner. I'll have my monitor at home and I'm finished. That's all I'm going to do for the rest of my life. And other folks don't want to do that. They don't want to have to monitor it. They don't want to take the pills or they don't want to monitor it. They don't want to deal with even a little bit of bleeding risk. And so they'll take a tissue valve with the understanding that if they're younger, they're going to need another procedure sometime in their life. We have heard today about the mechanical valves and how they're used with patients. Then we learned all about the PROACT trial and the success that you had there with lower doses of blood thinners. And now we're hearing about the PROACT XA trial. Can you please share with all the patients out there what is so special about this clinical trial? Sure, so XA is uh, Roman numeral 10A uh, and 10A is part of our uh, coagulation cascade. So factor 10A is responsible for converting prothrombin to thrombin. So thrombin is something that we all have in our blood that allows us to clot or promotes clotting. And by inhibiting 10A, uh, that if there are medications that inhibit 10A, they prevent or reduce clotting. So I'm sure patients have seen advertisements on television, for drugs uh, that are used for uh, clots to the lungs or atrial fibrillation, these newer drugs, this is one of those newer drugs. So the drug that we're using in PROACT-10A is Eliquis or Apixaban. It's a 10A inhibitor. Uh, and after rigorous review and uh, a great deal of contemplation, both on the part of the scientific committee 
and on the part of the FDA, uh, we have started a trial called PROACT 10A, which will again be a randomized study, meaning that we will compare patients who have the drug Eliquis versus patients who have the drug Warfarin for an extended period of time and determine if they are equivalent. And indeed, if they are, then whomever would like to, if someone wants to switch from Warfarin to Eliquis, they'll be able to do that. So someone might say, well, why bother? And the reason is that if we're able to switch to Eliquis, it takes the inconvenience away. So the inconvenience of Warfarin is that you have to check it. The inconvenience of Warfarin is that you do have to watch your diet a little bit. You have to pay attention to some things. With Eliquis, you just have to take the pill twice a day. So uh, assuming that works out well, then we're going to have a scenario where a patient can have the onyx valve, the onyx mechanical valve, uh, and then be on Eliquis and Eliquis alone or with, an, or with a low dose aspirin and not have to check their blood thinner levels and have the same type of protection and the same type of durability. Um, I would add that it's important for people to understand that there's been a journey we've been on with this particular valve. So in 2002, I met Jack Buckros, who's the guy who invented the valve. But more importantly, Jack Buckros invented pyrolytic carbon. And that is the material that every single mechanical valve has been made of for 20 years. Wow. So everybody who has a mechanical valve, it has their valve made of pyrolytic carbon. So Dr. Buckros though had in his mind a goal to eventually be able to build a valve that was pure carbon. So pyrolytic carbon, uh, they're all pyrolytic carbon, but pyrolytic carbon originally required silicon to be doped into it so that it could be dispensed onto the leaflets even. Finally, he created one that was pure carbon and that's the onyx valve. So when we look at that valve under an electron microscope, it looks like a sheet of ice compared to all other valves, which look kind of like a gravel road. So you can imagine the blood seeing that smooth surface is less likely to be promoted to foreign traumas. And then furthermore, the design of the valve is engineered so that the flow through the valve mimics that of a normal aortic valve. And this is extremely important for the type of flow not only through the valve, but when the, once the blood gets on the other side of the valve into the aorta, that it has normal flow pattern. We think all of that, along with washing jets in the valve, contributed to, having it, it contributed to that valve having a lower likelihood of developing clot. And that's why we were able to lower to the, the dose of warfarin. And that's why now we've been cleared to do the 10A study, which we've already started. And actually our center is the highest enroller in the nation for that already. Uh, I've got to ask you the question, when your patients, when you share the PROACT 10A clinical trial with the patients who have an onyx valve, what's the response? What are you hearing back from the patients? If there's the opportunity to move from something that they have to check to something that they don't have to check, there's real advantage there. Plus we know that from the studies, we know that Elquis is a safe drug with respect to bleeding. So if we look at all the studies comparing the newer anticoagulants, Eliquis has always fared the best or at least as good as every other drug with respect to the risk of bleeding. So they're in general, they've been very interested. So patients are asking to be evaluated and as we evaluate them, we're enrolling them. Yeah, and that's the next the question. If you are a patient, how do you participate in a trial like this PROACT 10A? So 10A is going to be is available to anyone who's had an onyx valve for three months, basically. So when we initially implant the valve, for example, let's say I have a patient tomorrow for whom I implant an onyx aortic valve. Then three months after the implantation, they would be eligible to be randomized. In other words, they're either going to get the Eliquis or they're going to get Warfarin, and then they stay on those tracks until the study's finished. So uh, that also then applies to anybody who had their valve put in last year or the year before, as long as it's been three months since the implant. So first we're starting with the most recent folks and we're working our way back toward folks that have had their valve for quite a long time. And so I expect there's going to be a pretty robust enrollment. Yeah, I, I got to tell you, Dr. Gerdish, my inbox has been lighting up with questions about this clinical trial. So it seems like uh, the patients here are ready to try something new and different and get enrolled and see if they can help you and your team advance uh, the valvular therapy specific to this onyx valve. 
Got one more question for you before we wrap up is what else should patients know about the PROACT 10A trial from your perspective? What do you see as the future here for mechanical valves and patients as well? So I think that uh, we've learned a lot in the last uh, decade really as new technologies have come online uh, and we've recognized that there are some high value players and the onyx valve we knew was a high value player when we were able to perform the original PROAC study. Uh, and, I, and there was a lot of energy and interest invested in that by a lot of major centers and really great surgeons. So that there were so many implants and so many patients on the lower dose uh, warfarin regimen that it became obvious that the performance of the valve was different. So I think the most important thing in that sense is First of all, we, there is a valve that you can be on a lower dose of blood thinner, which is amazing. The other thing is that there is a valve that potentially you can be off of warfarin. So I think those are the important messages for the PROACT 10A study. I think maybe kind of more globally though, I think that as a patient looks at their options for valve surgery, they need to think about the type of valve. And when they choose a type of valve, they should learn which specific valve they're going to receive and why that specific valve. Because even in those subcategories that I talked about, there are subtle differences and they apply differently to different human beings. So it's important they understand that. They also want to determine if they're eligible for a less traumatic approach, right? A smaller incision that offers them exactly the same operation. It has to be exactly the same operation. And finally, that they be sure that at that golden moment, that golden opportunity when they're having heart surgery, that the surgeon is addressing every problem they have, whether that be changes in their aorta, the presence of atrial fibrillation, other valves that might be leaking that need to be repaired. All of those things need to be addressed. That would be my, my more global advice. You know, Dr. Gersh, I've heard a lot of great things from a lot of clinicians over the years and hearing about the golden moment when patients are getting ready to go through a heart valve procedure. I've never heard it described quite so eloquently. So thank you, because I think patients really need to think about that. They need to be 100% confident when they're being rolled into that operating room that their questions have been answered. And if there's one thing I know, you answer patient questions incredibly well, as you've done today, as you've done for, I don't know, the past 10 years that we've known each other. And Mark, I just want to take a quick second to say thank you and thank your entire team at Franciscan Health for all the wonderful work that you've been doing to advance valvular therapy and, and really take care of patients who need the help that your team provides. So thanks for everything you're doing and thanks for being with us today. Thank you, Adam. That's definitely our privilege. Thank you.